it comes to missing persons cases, there will always be a few that get stuck in my mind. The disappearance of Karen Sykes, for example, has been one of these cases. The odd facts of the case combined with the unanswered questions have caused me to continue to revisit this particular event. This video will be slightly different than most I have done, in that I will be presenting the evolution of my investigation into this case. Additionally, this video will be the first in a planned series of On the Trail segments, where I go visit and physically show you the locations where some individuals went missing. I've talked about this case before on my channel, but let's recap exactly what occurred. Karen Sykes was 70 years old and an incredibly experienced hiker. She spent much of her time exploring Washington's trails and writing books and articles about her experience. She was well known in the hiking community and considered by some to be a guru of the trails. Karen had always had a special connection to Mount Rainier National Park and on June 18th of 2014, she traveled there with her boyfriend Bob to hike the Owyhee Trail and photograph alpine flowers for a local publication. The Owyhee Trail runs in a north-south direction between two highways. The hike culminates at a series of beautiful lakes at the base of Governor's Ridge. Karen had hiked this trail numerous times before, but always beginning at the northern end. On June 18th, her plan was to begin at the south end. About four miles into the hike, the duo encountered snow and stopped because Bob needed a break and wanted to eat lunch. Karen wanted to scout ahead a bit and told Bob that she would be back within an hour. Karen would never return. A search and rescue operation would be started not long afterwards with many feeling confident her experience would lead to a successful search outcome. After three days, a helicopter spotted Karen's body next to Boundary Creek. It was difficult to reconcile the place she was found with the place she was last seen because it was far off trail and over a steep mountain ridge. Her body showed no signs of trauma, so it seemed impossible that she would have climbed Governor's Ridge and fallen off the other side. Given Karen's immense outdoor experience, many wondered how something like this could happen to her, and I can see why. Additionally, theories have abounded as to how Karen could have gotten to the location she was found. These range from normal, to paranormal things such as portals. I was left as baffled as anyone else. So in July of 2021, I traveled to Rainier to hike the Owyhee High myself and go to the area Karen was last seen. The first mile or so of the Owyhee High is very beautiful with rivers and waterfalls. Eventually, the trails start climbing and you hit a long series of switchbacks as you travel up almost 2,000 feet in elevation. If you're not in shape, it would probably be a pretty tough hike. I finally came to roughly the spot Karen disappeared at about 4,700 feet. It's difficult to truly capture the scale of the area on camera, but the landscape is incredibly steep on either side as the trail crawls along the side of Barrier Peak. The foliage is thick and it would be difficult to go off trail in most areas simply due to that fact. There was little to no snow in the area at the time. I left Rainier with a good amount of strikingly amateur audio and video while feeling like I had not learned much of value about Karen's case, except that climbing over Governor's Ridge or even going off trail did not make any sense considering the unforgiving nature of the area. It wasn't until I finally received the National Park Service report on Karen's case that I had any new thoughts as to what could have happened to Karen. As you would expect, the NPS report goes into far greater detail than any news article you can find on this disappearance. According to the report, Karen was last seen at around 3 p.m. and Bob explained to rangers that once they hit snow, he was no longer comfortable going forward and stopped for lunch. Karen decided to push on further at that point. Bob waited an hour and then he tried to follow the tracks Karen left in the snow before turning back, initially claiming he never went past a large set of switchbacks on the trail, and then later saying he did go past the switchbacks. Bob tied a red handkerchief in the area at about 4,700 feet to mark the spot Karen was last seen. 
At around 8 p.m., a ranger commuting home on Highway 123 noticed Bob standing at the Awaihai trailhead. The ranger stopped to see if he needed any assistance. Bob explained that he had been hiking with his friend and she was two hours overdue in meeting back up with him. The ranger asked if he was concerned enough to inform authorities, and Bob told him, not yet. The ranger then told Bob the nearest place he could receive cell phone reception if he decided he needed to call 911, and then continued on with his commute home. Bob would stay at the trailhead until he encountered a hiking couple around 9 p.m. He told them he did not have a cell phone and asked them to call 911 once they got to an area with reception. The call would not be made until around 10 p.m. By 5 a.m. the next day, rangers were setting up a command post and sending men to the area Karen was last seen. Two park rangers who initially responded to that area expressed apprehension regarding the information provided by Bob. This was due to the rangers being unable to find any evidence of Karen's presence at the point on the trail where she was last seen. One ranger found some tracks and a bandana on the ground marking the spot where Bob had lunch, but could not find definitive evidence of Karen ever being in the area. Considering there was snow on the ground at the time, and Karen had gone on ahead alone, her presence should seemingly have been fairly easy to detect. The rangers then discussed the need to thoroughly interview Bob given the lack of evidence found at the scene. Bob was subsequently interviewed by investigators where he expanded on his story and provided new details. Bob believed that Karen would not travel far off trail in the snow, even to get a picture, but that his gut feeling told him that she had fallen through snow somewhere, either on the trail or not far from it. Both Bob and a friend of Karen's stated that they did not think Karen would walk off trail to end her life. At the time of her disappearance, Karen was reportedly carrying a GPS with her, though she apparently did not like using it. Karen did not like snow and would avoid it if possible. This would seemingly eliminate the idea of her going off trail at the location she was last seen because there was plenty of snow in that area. Bob stated that Karen did not like crossing creeks and was hesitant about crossing foot logs and bridges and that if she got lost, she would try to find a way around them instead. As previously stated, the Awaihai has a number of these bridges in the first mile of the trail. He also stated that she would avoid traveling up areas of deep snow, such as on ridges and peaks. Rangers interviewed one of Karen's best friends, who told them that Karen would know how to build a shelter if she was lost and that had she lost the trail, she would likely make an attempt to find it again. She believed that if Karen was injured, she would probably stay in one place, also adding that due to Karen's love of photography, she would sometimes go to great lengths to get a photo. They spoke with another friend who added additional details, like it was a common occurrence for Karen to sometimes hike ahead of others. They stated she was in great shape and had good balance, but poor eyesight. On June 21st, Karen's body was spotted by a helicopter as it flew over Boundary Creek. Subsequently, two rangers were dropped off to secure the area. Some initial observations made were of drag marks in the snow just north of the body, which eventually led to boot impressions that soon became impossible to follow. The helicopter pilot had flown over the area extensively in the prior few days and had not noticed any body or prints. Karen's body was in a sitting position, her feet laying in the creek water, and she was wrapped in an emergency blanket. Karen's backpack, fanny pack, and cameras were never found, or clues revealing her travel route. The medical examiner noticed no signs of trauma to Karen's body, and her death was determined to be accidental by way of hypothermia. There are a number of things that concern me after reading the NPS report. First is the fact that the rangers who initially responded to the point last seen were unable to find any sign that Karen had been in the area. Yet Bob claimed he was able to follow her tracks for some time. This contradiction is never resolved in the report. Second is the fact that Bob waited so long to report Karen missing. After she was last seen around 3 p.m., 
It would take around seven hours before authorities were finally contacted. Third, Karen's backpack, fanny pack, and camera were never found. What happened to these items? The location along Boundary Creek where Karen's body was discovered also intrigues me. I had always thought it was discovered even further north. Boundary Creek runs right through the Owyhai Trail, and given the lack of evidence found at the location she reportedly disappeared, I began to wonder if Karen had walked off trail at the point where Boundary Creek meets the Owyhai. I went back to Rainier shortly after. Hey everyone, here today at Mount Rainier National Park on the Owyhai Trail. This is the same trail Karen Sykes disappeared on. This is about the second time I've been here in as many months. The first time, we came to about the spot where she disappeared. Roughly. We don't know for certain. And I wanted to check if it was possible for her to have gone off trail and gone over Governor's Ridge to the location where she was found at Boundary Creek. And from what I could see, that didn't seem possible. So we're here today to actually go to Boundary Creek itself and see how easy it would be to actually go up that creek. And the goal is just to find a logical explanation to this case. Hopefully we'll find something that's informative and we can all learn something. So we'll see you soon. Hey everyone, kind of at the end of our journey here, and after actually seeing Boundary Creek, it looks like it would be possible to get up and around. I just don't know why anyone would want to. And, you know, the goal here, like I said, was to find a logical explanation for this case. And I think that's necessary that we try to do that first and foremost. We could look at paranormal explanations, but anything goes when it comes to that. It could be portals, whatever you want, really. And it's, it's just important to me, and in my opinion, to find a logical explanation first. And she could have done it, and we just don't know why. You know, if you look at the report on this case, the evidence that she was on the Owyhai and the location where she disappeared, it's a little shaky. The, the witness in that case was also a little shaky. So we don't actually have all the information we need to make an informed decision on this. And, you know, the end result is that we just have another missing persons case we don't have answers and you know I'm getting pretty used to that but I hope that this video was informative nonetheless and it got us a little closer to an answer in this case this location at Boundary Creek looks pretty intimidating but someone could go up either side of the creek and follow it to the location where Karen was found. It would no doubt be difficult, but Karen was known to be a good scrambler, and when compared to going over the top of Governor's Ridge, this option makes a lot more sense. Even after everything, I can't say for certain what happened to Karen Sykes. One thing this case has made me think about is how little we know about an individual's mental state when they go missing. If Karen did go off trail at Boundary Creek, then what made her want to do so? Was she heading back to the trailhead alone and her fear of walking across log bridges forced her to try and find another way around? Or did she purposely head up Boundary Creek for reasons we simply don't know? There are still many lingering questions about this case, but after thoroughly researching it, 
I think many of the paranormal theories I've heard can be ruled out. I feel that whatever happened here was decidedly human. And for now, that will have to suffice as an answer. Until next time, thanks for watching.